have uh, 20 minutes with which to uh, um, explore this topic as a group. Um, does anyone like to? by uh, Vanessa, uh, Mustafa, and uh, Megan, because um, uh, you all, and then in all nations, that formula apportionment as a possible um, alternative to for digital economy. And I have a question about intangibles, because formula apportionment, uh, typically formula apportionment system excludes intangible from the asset vector. But intangibles, various intangibles, are a typical feature in a digital economy. So how do you see this conceptual or practical uh, conflict in, in, in this regard? For example, EU has CCCCG directive proposal, and it follows US experiences to exclude intangibles from asset sector, uh, which is still under debate. So I want to receive your insights on this. So, so. Two, two, should we take those two and then we'll go back to the panel? So that, that, that's your question. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Kimura from Brussels University in Netherlands. Um, I have a question to Martin, uh, which is, I think currently the OECD process is seen as kind of an opportunity to make some kind of international tax reform. And listening to your story, I was thinking, are you arguing that interests are diverging, so actually the agreement will be less likely than we might generally conceive now? Um, or is your argument that some states will be left out? I was wondering about that. Just a, sm just a, just a small question to Mustafa is, is there any regional coordination or cooperation uh, among these countries regarding digitalization? Sorry. Uh, While I, I would really support the idea of an international <coughs> tax organization, I guess the question is why would that be able in any way to avoid the avoidance? You know, it has exactly the same issues that there will be the um, perhaps weak organization set against multinationals with hundreds and hundreds of lawyers. So how do you reframe the system so it can't be gained? Right, so should we, take, should we just take those in the same order that we spoke? So Mark, if you want to go first. Thanks. Thanks very much for those questions. Should we can have a long chat after this about this, about this the detail of the question. But I think that um, 
I think that there is an interesting question about what kind of opportunity this is right now. Um, so a box has been opened up, which was previously closed. And uh, as we've all, to some degree, talked about that. Um, and I suppose the, the question is how ambitious you are about how you think world of tax governance should work, and how you think investor tax rules should look. And, and then what part, pathway you think you can chart through this opportunity that's come to that. Um, I think that, um, for example, it does rather feel like what's happened is a very um, effective intervention by the OECD to reassert its, um, uh, its central place in the international taxation in a way that, uh, in a way that makes it rather hard to see what other value the UN has right now. And which is kind of a question I have for you, really, which is given that developing countries are in the OECD inclusive framework now, when you see, how do you see that affecting your proposal? Um, uh, so, so I think there's a strategic element. I don't think anybody knows the answer right now, but I think it depends a bit on what your ultimate objective is. Um, uh, but I'd like to talk more about all the other stuff. Um, and for Indra, um, oh, one more thing, just to refer to Blake. So I just wanted to very quickly address uh, your very, very legitimate criticism of the idea of digital tax justice. The reason that I include corporations in the necessity for fairness is because I'm extremely pro-profit, because you need very high profits so I can tax you at very high levels and get the revenue out to the country. So I definitely want prop like corporations to be able to make an eye-watering amount of money, and so therefore we can tax them a percentage of an eye-watering amount of money fund these very necessary development programs. I don't want it to be unfair and therefore have them lobby even so much harder <laughs> into more favorable, more lenient tax structures. So that's why I'm thinking about that question. Okay. That's right. Um, so uh, for, for Indra, um, uh, I'm arguing state interests are diverging or that some states are left out both. I, I, what I'm saying is that we, uh, and I didn't say this clearly enough, we traditionally analyze the way in which the politics of international tax works to different levels. There was the onshore offshore lens, so the large states versus the tax havens, but a PGM's intervention to say, yes, but actually the large states are also tax havens, it's money that was. Um, but also between the residence country and the source country, the residence country being the capital exporter and the source country being the capital importer. And what I'm saying is that 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 conceptual dichotomy no longer characterizes the politics of our tax. There's a new set of conceptual dichotomies. One important one is between the market country and then whatever is left within the source bracket, which I think is comes down to the fact that the origin country. Um, so there are some countries which are neither residence countries nor market countries, and that's the point that the UN paper makes. What about those countries? So I, I think what that means is the politics, the traditional alliances we're used to seeing, are a bit broken down. Because actually, in particular, we're seeing a real conflict between the US and everyone else, which now is perhaps starting to get a little bit resolved. But the, the traditional OECD bloc is split. The EU is, I can't look at that, it's just my head, is, <laughs> is fundamentally split. And so analyzing the politics, it looks different to how it used to look, because it's now not about source and residence, but about these other issues. Oh, and then just, uh, another part, just in, uh, Shu's question about um, in the formula, you asked about whether intangible assets go as well. But I think the really important question is how do you calculate data? Data is the important answer. Why does that go in terms of that? So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to pick up uh, on that question. I think what he says is, is actually some of the issues. <coughs> it's difficult to, to sort of characterize this. The data, how do you value data? And if you look at, um, I think it's, it's deliberate. Uh, because if you look at currently, if you look at Apple, Google, Amazon, Uber, they are using the IP to minimize uh, taxes, and that is why some 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 people are of the opinion that we should use throw out the uh, uh, throw back uh, rules. So I think it's, it's it's deliberate, but I believe that um, in the long term um, there has to be some sort of solution that we take into consideration both the demand and supply side of, of, of everything. But as it is now, um, I think it will be too risky, and um, you know, going uh, putting that in the formula with, with, with the opportunity of them placing those IPs in, in, in this 
tax havens within, uh, I think, the country productive. In terms of whether there's a regional cooperation regarding digitalization, so uh, I know of EAC doing something in terms of integration, but uh, in terms of um, uh, nexus policy, uh, um, profit allocation, uh, I'm unaware if, if there's anything going on in, in Africa. So, uh, Felicia, I understand that you uh, you weren't able to hear the questions very well. Is that right? Mm. She's still here. Can't hear at all. <laughs> okay, we don't look happy, Felicia. Fine. Right. In fact, it's not particularly disastrous. She didn't hear the questions very well. Um, so. So we have to go to another round. We've got time for another round. So there was uh, one. I, don't, I think, yeah, I think yeah. we missed a couple. Uh, just oh, sorry. To very, very quickly address your. You're right. The developed countries have been included in the OECD inclusive framework, but I find a very qualitative difference between an invitation extended and membership. I think that's a really important difference. There's a difference between being invited to the table and just having a guaranteed seats. Uh, that's why I don't find that. Uh, there's also one question about why would the ICO help avoid avoidance, which I don't work working properly, sorry. Uh, I don't know, but I do know that, that we have this opportunity for change and the international tax system has so heavily disadvantaged developing countries since, uh, since the origin, <coughs> 1924, I think, which is more. The League of Nations published 1928 for these source and residence taxing rights allocations and they've been exactly the same and we are in this moment of change and if we could just get forward with a new system that at least is not heavily disadvantaged but call me an optimist maybe benefit maybe benefit not just the 34 countries that comprise the OECD that would be my ideal I don't know the nuts and bolts of how it would help anti-avoidance but I think that's an important step forward do you have any further comments or we get to the next round of questions okay great um, Felicia's back on oh, the Felicia, did you back online? No, okay. <laughs> Looks like not. Right, sorry. You had been wanting to ask a question for, since the previous round, so do you want to, do you want to go, go ahead? Oh, yeah. Well, my name is Intervey. CAO as a possible model. Um, I don't remember you saying anything, I hope I didn't miss it, about how it, how it makes its decision for more principle. It's a book that I'm not familiar with. It's put me in mind of the World Trade Organization, which is near university, which meets, almost meets the same criteria. And it's for falling into deadlock because of its system of con uh, consensus decision making. Um, we've, got, we've got the question. So yeah. I'm just hurrying people up so we can. Yeah. Okay. Have you thought about where, what the best way would be? Yeah, uh, Christian, thanks for your birthday. So uh, just some thoughts from the guys. Um, so um, a, a lot of focus on corporate taxation, but these digital companies, these are big monopolies. So surely antitrust policy may even have a bigger role to play. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Right, so we've got um, a, 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 just enough time for, for the three of you. I have a question as well, if I can, if I can add one to the, to the list, and don't address it if you don't have time. But given that issue that this is an area where we, what we're talking about is monopoly rents, um, uh, 
is the norm whereby we seek to avoid double taxation even relevant in this area? So um, do you want to do you want to answer all of the questions for each in turn so that I know that you're done rather than sort of taking some of them one at a time So Martha, do you want to answer? Do you want me to answer all of the questions all of the Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, if not FDI, what? Uh, uh, Antonio, I think I think the point is that the Maybe the point is that the conceptual distinction between trade and investment is blurred by data. Um, so uh, if you think about the way that it's, it, it sees moving in the EU, you have a free, you have the you have the four fundamental freedoms, which included freedom of establishment, which is kind of flowing and freedom from uh, trade goods and trade services. And there's now a freedom, that, that there's now a kind of a movement to, to describe the EU data. So I think maybe what's happening is we have a set of businesses which we have the creation of a new market, a new cross-border transaction type, which doesn't fit into the existing boxes of capital flow or service flow or good flow. Um, and that's, so that's not really an answer to your question, it, but it's the best I can do. Um, uh, is Spotify typical? I'm not sure that there's a, is there a typical? I chose Spotify for two reasons as an example. One, um, because, uh, very well illustrates that the, the story about Latin America very well illustrates the political problems, and partly because it's not an American company, company, and I think it's quite relevant to the brain mind that we focus all the time on US companies, but actually Sweden has a, an interest here which actually is quite closely aligned to that of the US. Um, so that's why I chose to focus on. Um, uh, yes, good point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Chris, yes, also, yes. Good point. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no. I think it's relevant. I think. I think. I think that what we're seeing here is that um, tax is the uh, canary in the coal mine for a bigger set of issues. I think that what we're seeing is that a whole set of economic regulation areas are being challenged by the way that the economy is changing. And I think that for some reason, which I'm not quite sure of, it's become visible in tax more quickly and more prominent. So I think the first one was my <laughs> is my very ambitious idea of international tax organization too ambitious, <laughs> and I mean probably, but I don't think that should let us stop. Uh, so yes, I guess in the 1950s it would have been principally easier. It's the same reason why the OECD does run tax because it's easier to get four, 34 units <coughs> and to agree to something than it is the 195, of course. But developing countries need to, and are beginning to, argue collectively, which I think is the big, big turning point with this. And ITO within the United Nations would observe the Committee of Experts, it would be members who represent our countries, and therefore they would have the political legitimacy. And uh, over the last several decades, most recently, I think in 2015, at Addis Ababa, the Development for Financing Conference, Finance for Development Conference, uh, this was once again put on the table. It's something that keeps coming up and it's getting louder and louder. So I don't think it's too ambitious. I think we're heading in that direction. And I think getting on board would be believable. Uh, why AKO? Why, how would that sidestep the WTO uh, deadlock? I don't have a great answer for that, uh, unfortunately. I will say that despite the fact that the WTO uh, does grip lock up, it is also relatively uh, successful in preventing trade wars, which was its kind of principal mission. It is, in my opinion, at heart a defensive organization and therefore has succeeded if you look at it within those measures. Uh, <coughs> I know this doesn't answer your question, but unfortunately I have to think about it a little bit more. Uh, and finally, should we throw out double taxation altogether? I don't have an answer for that at all. So I guess my answer for all these questions is mostly <laughs> yeah, so also on the, on the double taxation, I'm, I, I think Martin is the expert of treaties, but um, at this stage, I'm not sure it's something that um, we can just throw out. I think, uh, I mean, I think um, it's still it's irrelevant, I, I believe it's still relevant, particularly from, uh, from the, the, the perspective of African countries, uh, I think it's irrelevant. Oh, yeah, is that the, that's the
that's the only point that was necessary. Is that the only question that's necessary? Um, so I'm not sure I understand the question on antitrust policies. I'm not sure. 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 i Right, you, you haven't heard any, any, heard any of the questions. I, I suppose um, what we could do is just check if there's anyone in the audience who had a question for Venetia that didn't get answered, then we can, we can, we can just try it again. Yeah, um, can I, can I try it again? Yeah, as loud as you can. Okay. Um, how do you see the CCCTV directive proposal and digital, significant digital nexus proposal? What's the relation? between them, in your opinion, as to digital economy, the end? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, well, I think that the intention of the digital service tax and the second proposal for the significant digital presence directive is much more wide than the CCV directive. You, you you correctly mentioned that the 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 proposal of the digital service tax and the the proposal for a new a digital service presence tax is not aimed specifically at intangibles. Uh, it tries and um, it aspires at least to a, a significant percentage to to touch on other types of. Uh, activities that spring into the digital economy. And this is one of the major hurdles that uh, has caused the pausing of the, uh, of the proposal because there was such diversity in the various models and economic types that we see in the digital sector that it was very difficult to find criteria in order to establish a significant digital presence. So it, there is some correlation, but I don't think that the, uh, the, the, the proposed directive for digital service tax is limited to intangibles, but instead it has a much, much wider scope that uh, it remains to be seen how it will be materialized, if at all. Thank you very much. And can we have a round of applause to thank our um, group panel? Thank you. Thank you.